Start the chicken stock that you already have ready there. A little drop of that. Just a drop of that. I'm going to blend a little bit of the stock with a little bit of garlic here and throw that as well. Just the same stock and just garlic, a little bit of the cilantro stuck in there. Saute that as well again. Now we're going to throw some raisins, plenty of raisins in there, some green olives, fresh cilantro, and now some tomatoes. Throw some cloves of garlic. I'm going to do some um, whole peppercorn as well. Throw a few of them in there that I have here. Here we go. Let it just simmer a little bit. Now, you can feel a little bit of that. I sort of like the fact that it turns into and blackens like that, and that we can use it in such. Just move it like that a little bit. Then open the chili. In such. Now my plates come out with lots of uh, greens. Do I, do I wait? Throw some cilantro. This wonderful chicken that we've been cooking. And put it inside your pepper. Such. Ya no. All inside there. You can put lots of the broth over that. Make sure you have your olives. some fresh some more of your um, raisins on the side there Taping time, the executive chef at the Weston Pinal Place in New Orleans was Christian Gilles. He's a Frenchman with all of the requisite skills that a culinary career in that country implies. He says that eating is one of the great measures of a culture and people. Here is his orange chocolate mousse. So now what uh, we'd like to prepare in front of you is the chocolate uh, orange mousse. And uh, it's absolutely uh, delicious, and it's a uh, little bit different than the regular chocolate mousse or what we can find uh, mostly everywhere. And uh, to begin in that, I, uh, I have, of course, uh, a mix here. So I make, I make an addition of uh, whipping cream here, and I would like to beat that to until the cream is very firm. So probably we have to make some noise. Take off, and you can see it's very firm. 
three egg yolks are then beaten. Make sure to try to clean, to keep clean your egg white because you have to use them after that to fold in your, uh, in your melted chocolate. So all the time try, try to keep your egg white very clean. So you have to beat your eggs until they come in like a um, uh, lemon color, that's been more or less lemon pal. To that, to that I add the oranges and the vanilla extract. And I keep turning that at least for 10 more minutes. Then, of course, by question of timing, I melted already my chocolate and I fold that in my chocolate. So what I have to do, I going back to my double boiler here and finish to mix that with my chocolate. Meanwhile, the three egg whites are beaten to the stiff peak stage. And I would like to show you exactly um, what kind of consistency of the egg white to having a nice uh, and light chocolate mousse. I bring my cream here and my egg white. And fold Usually before we, uh, we do that, we need to uh, set on the side in a, in a refrigerator at least for four hours before we fold down in, uh, in, uh, in the glasses. So what we did is we prep another one here and we set on the side here and we decorate with a mint. And that chocolate must stay at least for four hours before we put in uh, champagne glasses. So another dish you want to serve that and use that to make sure it's very firm. Welcome to Great Chefs, a culinary tour of the United States, featuring some of the country's finest chefs. The menu starts with Robert McGrath at Scottsdale, Arizona. He offers a skillet gratin with crawfish tails, vegetables, and the surprising addition of foie gras. 
For the main course, Peter de Young in Beaufort, South Carolina, offers salmon two ways, as a Napoleon seared with honey and rosemary, and as tartare. The finale is from J.J. Stith in Las Vegas. She presents her rendition of banana cake, flavored with milk chocolate custard and served with hazelnut chocolate sorbet. is a popular spot in Scottsdale. It is also a river that runs through Aspen, Colorado. The restaurant touts the great Western cuisine of Robert McGrath. He helped open it in 1997 after getting much attention at the Scottsdale Phoenician Resort. Here is his crawfish skillet gratin. We start with some bacon, pearl onions, green beans, shallots, mushrooms, red bell pepper, and garlic. I think the bacon, the fat cooking out of the bacon, um, we're not a health food restaurant, by the way, in case you all haven't picked up on that yet. But uh, the, f the flavor of the bacon, the pork fat, to me, really works well with shellfish. Uh, whether it's crawfish or lobster or shrimp, I like that association very much. We're going to add some green beans, some pearl onions, and we're going to get this mixed up a little bit. That went right in the garbage can for you TV viewers at home. We would never throw any food on the floor here. The beans and onions were pre-cooked. Add some mushrooms, get those started. And some chopped shallots. And some red bell pepper. Now the red bell pepper has been roasted peeled, cleaned out of seeds, and then cut into a, sort of a coarse shape. We try to get our cuts here looking as natural as possible. We're not into very highly manicured foods. We're more concerned with the quality of the ingredients that we're using and with the overall flavor of the dish. The last ingredient was chopped garlic. After we've added those ingredients, I'll let those saute for just a little bit. We're going to add some crawfish tails. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you can use rock shrimp to substitute for the crawfish if you're not in a part of the country where you have access to these. To me, the, the crawfish, the meat's very firm and sweet. Again, it works well with the bacon. And we're going to let those warm up just a little bit. We're going to get this burner hot because we're going to be topping this off with a little piece of magic here in a second. We're going to add white wine. We're going to let that reduce quickly. And we're going to add a little bit of cream. I suggest that before you add the entire amount of the cream in the recipe that you let this reduce first a little bit. And then we're going to add a little adobo sauce. Now, you don't need much of this. You can get a lot of mileage out of a small amount of this. And this is available pretty much around the country anymore. You should be able to find these, uh, this adobo sauce in most Mexican food sections of just about any restaurant, not even a specialty restaurant. If you have trouble finding just the adobo sauce, you can always find the chipotle chilies in adobo sauce, and then just use your spoon to collect the sauce out of that. We're going to add a little kosher salt and a little fresh cracked black pepper. We're going to pull that over here and just continue to reduce that. And I'm going to get this skillet hot real quick. Now, one of the things that we like doing at this restaurant is 
what we call cutting flavors. We like the flavors to be highly contrasting. So they need to be compatible. They need to be flavors that'll work together, but that cut through each other. So that heightens the sensation of each of the flavors. We are not into doing the homogenous uh, flavors and, and everything's so subtle that the nuances are, are barely perceivable. We want, we want the flavors to be robust. We want them to slash through each other. And so this is why we add something like the chipotle or the adobo sauce into the crawfish and why we're gonna to top it with some Hudson Valley Fogua. Uh, this has become something uh, of, of a very recognizable ingredient in a short time. Michael Ganor uh, has really enabled this product to get into the mainstream. Now you want this skillet just to get hot enough where you're just about smoking, but I don't want to put it on this right now on the heat. I want to pull it off the heat a little bit and let it sear off the heat. And I'm going to take this crawfish gratin that we've done, and we're going to put it into a, a small skillet. You want to keep an eye on this foie gras behind you. You do not want to let it overcook or burn because it will just reduce itself into fat. So I'm going to top this with a little bit of the, the sauce we have in here. We're going to sprinkle some breadcrumbs on top. Now you can do this in a bowl as well. It does not need to be done in a skillet. And then we're going to take this piece of foie gras and just add it right on top. And from there you would put it in your, your broiler at home. And we're going to let that brown up nicely. We're going to take that, we're going to serve it on a plate with a folded napkin to keep the skillet from sliding around. And we're going to garnish it with some small sprigs of chervil. Now this dish can be done in a variety of ways. Obviously, the way we're doing this is simply a suggestion. If you don't prefer to have cream in your recipe, omit the cream. If you don't care to have the adobo sauce in there, omit the adobo sauce. The idea here is we're trying to give you a dish that has the potential to be moved around according to your particular taste, but you need the crawfish, you need the onions, you need the foie gras, and what we have here is a skillet gratin of crawfish, green beans, and foie gras. The Buford Inn in the quiet South Carolina town of the same name featured the food of Peter de Young. He calls it New Southern Cuisine, and he's offered it to some pretty big stars, Sharon Stone and Entourage, who showed up late, and Robert Duval, who served his party. Here's salmon, Napoleon, and tartare. The chef begins with puff pastry. He'll cut scallop discs, which will become layers of the Napoleon, and a sawtooth-edged crown garnish. The crown is shaped in a small ramekin. It will be filled with dried beans before baking.
Holes are poked into the discs to inhibit too much rising. Egg wash is brushed on and all are baked at 375 degrees for about 20 minutes. Now the salmon is cut. Going to need some slices of salmon about an inch thick. The salmon rounds are part of the napoleon, while the scraps will be used for the tartare. With the pieces of salmon, we're going to make uh, a little salmon tartare. Most of the standard ingredients that garnish tartare are included here, but they're all mixed together in the food processor, including onion, capers, Dijon mustard, and egg yolk. seasoning the salmon with fresh rosemary. The salmon is sautéed in butter. is medium rare. Honey tops one surface of the disc. Sautéed zucchini is a side dish. It's cooked in hot garlic-infused oil. Balsamic vinegar is added.
A little caviar garnishes the tartare. J.J. Stiff graduated from the California Culinary Academy in San Francisco, then worked in several Bay Area restaurants, including One Market. Now at Aqua Restaurant in the fabulous Bellagio Hotel, she offers her creative desserts to that exclusive clientele. Here's a chocolate banana cake. The banana bread is begun by creaming butter with the paddle attachment. And then dump in the brown sugar and the white sugar. Now I'm gonna be adding the eggs with a little vanilla with the vanilla extract in them. Slowly whip it up some. And I add the bananas all at once. The riper the bananas, the better. Now that the bananas are smashed, adding the flour, baking soda, and salt. The flour has been sifted with the baking soda. And since I'm making this in a small mix, I usually mix it a little bit before I put it back on so you don't have a flour storm or dust storm. The batter goes into a buttered loaf pan and is baked at 350 degrees for an hour. The milk chocolate custard begins with hot heavy cream with the meat of a scraped vanilla bean added. Thank you. And I whisk the hot cream into the milk chocolate slowly so it's not to break it. After the mixture is incorporated, it's set aside to cool before egg yolks are added. And slowly whisk the custard into the, I'm sorry, slowly whisk the chocolate mixture into the egg yolks. I'm tempering is what I'm doing, so I don't break the eggs or overcook the eggs. The custard is strained, then will be combined with a portion of the cooled banana cake. After it's cooled, I took about half of that and I ground it fine like breadcrumbs, I guess. You need uh, about eight 
ramekins or tin balls, which these are stainless steel tin balls lined with, uh, you spray them and line them with paper. And it's going to get baked in a little hotel pan or a little baking dish. To this, we're going to add some really finely chopped milk chocolate of good quality. And you add enough custard just to make a smooth paste. For about that half loaf of banana bread, it's about a cup, maybe two cups of liquid. And you fill the molds. The molds are cooked in a water bath for an hour in a 300 degree oven. Rotate the pan halfway through. Design on the plate with just regular piping chocolate. Mint sauce. Don't show that sad. This is chocolate and caramel mixed together and piped into a lattice shape. Finally, chocolate hazelnut sorbet. Finished presentation, milk chocolate banana cake with Gianduja sorbet. Welcome to Great Chefs, a culinary tour of the United States, featuring some of the country's finest chefs. Jimmy Ishii in Memphis, Tennessee offers two starters. First, a soft crab spring roll with miso dressing, then salmon sashimi marinated in soy sauce, sake, and vinegar. Then from Minneapolis, Pierre Gardin presents sautéed Atlantic salmon with braised curry-flavored fennel and a blanched tomato cup holding steamed broccoli. Dessert is from New Orleans. Shane Gorring sates all chocolate nuts with his Napoleon of chocolate mint candy, canals of chocolate mousse on a pool of reduced creme de menthe. Notable features at Jimmy Ishii's Seksusi of Japan in Memphis is a private dining room featuring an eight-course menu of Japanese specialties. The first course is salad, followed by, in Japanese, sukuri. We offer the two as an appetizer, crab soft spring roll and salmon sashimi. The spring roll is started by hydrating rice paper and water. This is rice spring roll skins. Soak in the water for a while. And this is a red miso dressing. Just wait to get soft.
The ingredients that go into the roll include avocado slices, whole chives, cucumber spears, and snow crab legs. Avocado chive. Cucumber. This is a snow crab. A spoon of the red miso paste goes into the bottom. The second course features a marinated and briefly blanched piece of salmon, the hot Japanese horseradish wasabi, and mixed greens. Tetsuya Masako will assist. Yeah. This, uh, this is a fresh salmon, put in a boiled water, and cook a little bit. The inside is like a medium layer. And we marinate it with a uh, yuzu sauce, which is a, a lemon, Japanese lemon. And marinated with soy sauce and sake and vinegar. And we make sashimi, we cut sashimi for this. Egg custard and fried rice flours are garnish. Some of the marinade is mixed with the wasabi for the sauce. Dijon was home to Pierre Gardin. After cooking school, he worked in several French restaurants, then came to the States in 1983. He worked in Chicago at Tango and Escargot before joining the Sofitel Hotel. From that property in Minneapolis, 
Here is sautéed salmon in red wine butter sauce. So we're going to start by the fennel. Need to remove the core. Fennel and onion are served as a side dish. Slap it thin. Onion. So you know, in the pan we take a bit of butter. The olive oil. The fennel, the onion, a bit of garlic, a bit of curry powder. Cook it until uh, tender. Okay, for the sauce, we reduce, we put this aside, and uh, we'll reduce some uh, red wine with some uh, shallots. And reduce it until uh, you have a syrupy mixture, almost like a thick. Okay. And while the while the wine is reducing, start the salmon. So it's sweet up a frying pan with some oil. Season the salmon on both. On the side. So you put the salmon skin down, skin down first. And leave it like this until the skin is uh, crispy. Okay. Yeah, for, the, for the vegetable, take some uh, broccoli and just uh, steam it.
you know, they say real quick, just to mark it a bit. And then you put it in an oven, about 375. Let's take a tomato. And we scoop it out. The tomato cup will hold the broccoli and is also briefly steamed. Tomato will put in a steamer for just a minute. The wine reduction is getting close. Whole butter will be added to finish. To season a bit the broccoli, I'll put it in a whole butter and uh, salt and pepper. it with butter. Hold on there. And to season it, uh, to place it, just put it inside the tomato cup. Okay. We're going to finish the sauce. Now the red, red wine is reduced. Uh, so you want to add the butter. Butter is added uh, a little bit at a time on, on low heat. Okay, go ahead. The butter is swirled into the wine a piece at a time. Shane Garange's busy Zoe's Specialty Bakery is on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. A native of England, he's cooked all over the world and in New Orleans at Windsor Court Hotel. His own place now allows him full freedom. He developed this recipe for great chefs and calls it Chocolate Mint Napoleon. Okay, this is Chocolate Mint Napoleon. Um, we have on the stove right now, we have sugar and water coming to a boil. It's got to come to right below soft ball, which is about 112 degrees centigrade. So around about there. The powdered sugar. Mint extract. Bring that together and it should, it's going to turn into hard pieces of candy. Careful not to put your 
face over this pan because the fumes from the mint is going to get right in your eyes. And when that all comes together, it's onto a to cool. It's, some bits are going to be stick together. It's going to be large chunks, but we can just chop those up later. When the sugar cools down, the and the mint, we're going to make little chunks of it. Just want to pieces like that, irregular. Melted chocolate goes onto parchment paper. And then on one half of the chocolate, we're going to sprinkle the mint candy. Then we're going to fold over and just press. We're going to place a sheet pan and allow that to set. The chocolate mousse used in presentation is made with seven ounces of semi-sweet chocolate, four ounces of softened butter, four egg yolks, half a cup of chocolate liqueur, a half a pint of heavy cream whipped, and three ounces of sugar. Okay, to layer up the Napoleon, the prepared sheets, we peel off, and then you just break pieces. And you want to be able to, where it's like this, this is good because you see the mint inside, it's not just straight chocolate. Break off irregular pieces. I'm going to take a chocolate mousse. And then just take the pieces. Start setting them. Then we're going to leave that to set up for a little bit and get prep the plate. So we take a plate, we take a plate. This is a creme de menthe reduction.
Welcome to Great Chefs, a culinary tour of the United States, featuring some of the country's finest chefs. Donna Norton does the first course in Tucson, Arizona. Deep fried shrimp flautas stuffed with a shrimp, cilantro, onion, and chili mixture with tomatillo sauce. Then from Las Vegas, Alex Strada cooks marinated roasted spring lamb presented with baby vegetable fricassee along with sauteed sweetbreads and lamb juice. For dessert, Thaddeus Dubois on the Gulf Shore presents an upscale fruit shortcake, no strawberries. He uses peaches and raspberries, macerated in sugar and peach liqueur. Donna Norton's Café Terracotta in Tucson opened in 1986 and was an instant hit. Six years later, a second terracotta opened in Scottsdale. It was named one of Esquire magazine's best new restaurants of 1993. Donna Norton's ardent interest in southwestern cookery is evident with shrimp flautas. The filling is started with processing shrimp, cilantro, green onions, and chipotle puree. And we'll grind that. And we'll grind this. We'll be adding our uh, little bit of chipotle. You can add that right down through the hopper. Uh, the equivalent of two chipotles will be a couple of teaspoons. A little bit of salt while we're mixing in more of a dry form. This is just pureed so that you will have a, um, a smooth texture in part of this flauta and then we'll have some of the chunky texture along with it. So it gives you a whole range of uh, flavors and textures. Okay, an egg. Okay. Not all of the shrimp was processed. Some was held back and roughly chopped. And just, you can uh, transfer this to a bowl if you like or we'll just uh, add it right into the, the processor without having to uh, transfer it. Give it a stir with a spoon, and then the mixture's ready for filling the tortillas. Watch out for the hole there. And then we have our flour tortillas, which was spread out. You can spread out a few at a time and uh, scoop the mixture in near the bottom. If you do a few at a time, it's a little, saves you a little time rather than doing one at a time. This is a little bit of, a, of an egg wash that has a tiny bit of flour in it and we're using this as glue, kind of the old fashioned kids glue. And put some along the top 